the gender gap in STEM by creating educational opportunities such as this one and creating supportive communities. Uh, for example, we have our uh, Discord community, which you can join uh, from the link in our Instagram bio. But aside from that, today you are uh, attending our uh, gene editing workshop. And uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it on over to Bill. Well, thank you, Samantha. Good to be here talking to you on a Saturday afternoon. Um, hope it's not too cold in Toronto. I actually did my PhD in Toronto many years ago. So I have a, an affinity for that uh, city. It's a wonderful city. Um, so I am uh, currently at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine. This is in Farmington, Connecticut in the USA. And I've been editing the genomes of mouse and human stem cells for over 30 years. So that's a long time. Um, and today I wanna to talk to you about the uh, use of CRISPR for gene editing and how it's really transformed what we can do in the lab. And I think that'll come across in this talk as I describe how we used to do it and how we do it now. Um, trying to advance my slides. I don't get it, they not advancing. There are problem. Okay, so this is just um, <clears throat> what, what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna give you a brief history of gene editing and then move on to programmable nucleases of which CRISPR is one example. That's the preferred example of um, programmable nucleases. And I'll just tell you how um, this has transformed gene editing and how we use CRISPR. And I will talk about uh, a little bit from my current research and how we're using CRISPR to generate disease models in um, human cells. And then I will uh, end with um, a few stories about how CRISPR is now being used. Actually, it's now being used to cure disease in humans, which is extremely exciting. Now you are a group of uh, high school students, I believe. And so um, I thought we should start by testing your knowledge because I'm not quite sure what you guys have learned in high school. I mean, it's been over 40 years since I've been in high school. So um, I'm not sure how much you know about molecular genetics. So I'm gonna ask a, a series of questions and, and I guess the answers will come via chat. Is that right, Samantha? Yep, or people can unmute, but uh, chat is definitely preferred. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Um, who knows what is what the what is essential dogma? So uh, I've given you three options here. Which of these options describes the essential dogma? Fantastic, everybody knows that. All right, now chromosomes are composed of what? DNA, protein, RNA, all of the above. Okay, I get the consensus is, is correct. It's D, all of the above. People who said A are somewhat correct. It obviously does contain DNA, but uh, the DNA is wrapped around protein. Uh, if you take a chromosome out of a cell, it's going to be associated with protein, with RNA, because tr uh, uh, it's transcribed and some of the protein is associated with RNA and so on. So yeah, so it's a, it's a very complex mixture of DNA and protein, which is... Something that's really uh, amazing about CRISPR is that this enzyme, this nuclease can get access to that DNA, even though it's wrapped up in all of this protein. Okay, now the third question, DNA in your cells is single-stranded, double-stranded linear, double-stranded circular. So think about a chromosome and what it looks like. I'm talking about human cells, these are your cells. So which is it? Yeah, everyone has that right. Double-stranded linear is correct. So it's got one end um, and it's got a, a, another end. And these are linear DNA molecules, but they're wrapped around uh, these uh, nucleosomes and packed tightly into the, into the nucleus. So you wouldn't really know, um, looking in the nucleus, whether they're linear or circular. Um, <clears throat> so your chromosomes are located where? Cytoplasm, mitochondria, Golgi, nucleus? D is correct. Very good. 
All right, how long is the human genome? Give me some numbers here, the 3 million bases, uh, base pairs rather, 3 billion base pairs, 6 million. Let's see, I'm getting, yeah, I think we've, most of the answers are correct. It's 3 billion base pairs. That's huge. So, and if you think about a CRISPR enzyme trying to find a site to cut in a genome, it's got to scan um, all of this DNA to find that site, which is extraordinary as well. Okay, protein coding genes are, and choose all, all of the, all that apply. Uh, protein coding genes are made of peptides. They're transcribed into RNA. They're spliced into messenger RNA, and they're composed of exons. Which of those are correct? Okay, I'm getting Bs, Bs, Cs, and Ds, which are, is correct. A is not correct. A is incorrect. Uh, protein coding gene is a piece of DNA, which encodes for protein. Now, what proportion of your genome codes for protein? Seeing Bs. Most people are saying Bs, but actually a few people have got it right with 1%. So 1% of your genome encodes for protein. So there's a lot of DNA that um, <clears throat> is kind of the dark matter of the genome. We don't really know what it does. Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, and certainly there are, we can find sequences within, uh, outside of protein coding sequences, which are important for um, expression and for Chrom chromatin organization, but a lot of that is really unknown. And a lot of disease genes actually, um, through studies of, of uh, sequencing patients and so on, suggests that a lot of diseases are caused by uh, mutations outside of coding sequence. So we really need to understand what the non-coding, uh, non-protein coding sequence of the genome does. And that's one um, application of CRISPR, we can probe any any sequence in the genome to see what it does. Okay, so um, I've just shown you here a snapshot of the genome. I don't know if you've looked at the genome. We have the we have the genome of the human and many other um, organisms, but this is a typical gene structure in 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 the genome of humans. And I'm showing you a, a gene that you probably are familiar with. This is ACE2. This is the receptor for the coronavirus, and a lot of attention on this gene these days. And what you see is that these, um, I'm gonna to have to put on my laser pointer. These little ticks here, these are the exons. These are the exons that are spliced together to make the mRNA. So you can see this is a very large region. It's over a hundred kilobases long and that gets spliced down into a transcript that might be one or two KB in length. So a lot of that um, sequence is thrown away when you splice it together. The other thing you'll notice is that there are multiple uh, transcripts for any given gene. The ones in orange and yellow, these are protein coding. The ones in blue are presumed not to code for anything, yet they're still synthesized in the cell. So you see lots of coding and non-coding transcripts. So another, another kind of um, difficulty in understanding genes is that um, genes are composed of multiple in, uh, isoforms. And so we may understand one isoform very well, but the, we don't necessarily know what all of the isoforms are doing. Okay, so let me define gene editing um, and I will define it this way for this talk. It's the planned modification. So we design these modifications. So we plan the modification of double-stranded chromosomal DNA um, by a by changing or deleting or inserting one or more nucleotides. Uh, so we can change small numbers of nucleotides, we can delete big regions, we can insert uh, large uh, pieces of DNA. This is what gene editing does. Um, now, before CRISPR was discovered, you might be surprised to hear that gene editing really was only practiced in about two systems, yeast, where it's very efficient, um, and mammalian cells. 
and, and, and specifically mammalian stem cells. And the reason for this is that mammalian stem cells uh, are rapidly dividing cells and you need um, for gene editing to be uh, efficient. Uh, you need to have cells that are rapidly dividing so that they will undergo these events that will change the DNA. Um, and before CRISPR, even human stem cells were very difficult actually to uh, edit. And we're not quite sure why, what the difference between say a mouse stem cell and a human stem cell is, but they were uh, very difficult to, to uh, edit. Now post CRISPR, basically any cell, any embryo, or tissue of a plant or animal now can be edited, which is phenomenal. So, so CRISPR has really widened, broadened what we can do in a number of different um, uh, uh, systems. So the applications that um, uh, CRISPR editing is used, the, you know, the, the I think the most important, um, one of the most important uh, applications is to use CRISPR as a tool to probe the function of DNA sequences in the genome. So as I say, we can alter basically any sequence in the genome now. Uh, much of the sequence, we don't understand how it works. Even many genes, we don't understand how they work. So we can use CRISPR now to pick apart and discover what every gene in the human genome is doing, what every, what every stretch of DNA is, is presumably doing. Another very important application of CRISPR is that we can use it now to correct um, genetic or inherited diseases, which is extremely exciting. And there are a number of applications in agriculture where you can improve the varieties of plants and domesticated animals. You can make plants more healthy. You can make uh, domesticated animals more healthy and more productive. And what's interesting about CRISPR is that you're not, uh, you can do this without introducing any exogenous DNA. Basically, you're just making changes that, are, that, that, that exist in nature to improve uh, plants and animals. And so this falls out of the definition of uh, genetically modified organisms, because basically you're just uh, using CRISPR, you are um, uh, short-circuiting the, the, the time it would take you to breed in these various mutations that, that uh, uh, provide benefit to plants and domesticated animals. So it's quite an interesting area as well. I'm not involved in any agriculture project, projects, but certainly you hear about them in the news and they're, they're quite interesting. Okay, so here's a brief timeline of uh, genome editing. I'm, I'm not uh, including the work in yeast. I'm gonna focus here on, on editing and mammalian systems. Um, so gene editing uh, really came about around the time that people had discovered the properties of mouse embryonic stem cells, which I'll describe a bit uh, in a bit more detail later. Um, so these mouse embryonic stem cells turn out to be able, you know, it's, uh, turn out to be one of the few cells that um, we could efficiently edit back in the day. So I started my PhD in 1987. This was right around the time where uh, mouse embryonic stem cells were starting to be uh, used in the lab. And I was very excited to work with these cells because the property of these embryonic stem cells is that you could modify their genomes and then you could create mice with those modifications. And that's the whole sort of basis of this gene targeting uh, technology in mouse embryonic stem cells. And that's gone on for years and years. Um, and the first mouse knockout was actually in 1989, a couple of years after I started my thesis. And we all started using this technology in mouse embryonic stem cells to identify genes that were important in development, genes that were important for certain diseases and so on. And so there's been a huge amount of work that's gone on uh, in modifying the genomes of the mouse through this mouse embryonic stem cell technology. Now, uh, in 1998, human embryonic stem cells were derived by Jamie Thomas, uh, Thompson, rather, uh, in Wisconsin. And that was quite interesting, but also controversial because human embryonic stem cells were derived from um, um, fertilized uh, human embryos. 
so uh, you would uh, have to collect these uh, human embryos. They were usually discarded from IVF clinics. So there was a certain amount of controversy about their use because it meant destroying a human embryo. Now, luckily, um, and around 1998 was around the time people started using uh, uh, what are called programmable nucleases, which um, include zinc finger nucleases, tail nucleases, and, and finally CRISPR. These programmable nucleases, as I will describe later, really improve the, what you can do in terms of um, gene editing. Uh, so these were coming out around the time that we had these human embryonic stem cells. Uh, so the prospect of actually understanding what genes are doing in human cells uh, became a real possibility. Uh, fortunately, um, uh, Shinji uh, Yamanaka developed a way to actually generate human uh, stem cells, which we call human-induced pluripotent stem cells or human iPS cells in 2007. Now, this is not controversial at all because these cells come from somatic cells of your body, either your skin or your blood, for example. And he, he, he developed a way to reprogram somatic cells back to an early embryonic state, uh, a pluripotent state. And these are called human iPS cells. And these are the cells that I work with currently. Uh, so this is a, this is a, tr a tremendous uh, discovery as well. Um, and and he, uh, Yamanaka was a, uh, awarded uh, Nobel Prize for his work with reprogramming of cells. Um, so once these nucleases came to the fore, uh, we started to see their uh, application in humans. So the first uh, trial, which was meant to, to uh, cure HIV, uh, used zinc finger nuclease directed against the HIV receptor, CCR5, and that trial has been successful. And this uh, now stands as the first um, a gene, uh, you know, successful gene therapy with one of these programmable nucleases. Uh, you might remember a couple of years ago uh, the story of CRISPR babies, and I'm going to talk about this at the end of, end, end of my um, lecture. Uh, this is very controversial. So now that these uh, nucleases could be used uh, both in cells and in embryos, uh, a group in China. Uh, decided to try this to um, inactivate the CCR5 receptor in uh, human embryos and, and take those embryos to term. And so we have now CRISPR babies that have been modified, um, deliberately modified with mutations in this gene CCR5. And I'll get back to that. And I think what's most exciting of all uh, in recent news uh, in June, uh, the, the, the trial, the uh, first uh, results of a trial um, to try to cure sickle cell anemia with a CRISPR uh, came out and it looks very successful. So there are only a few individuals in this study, but they are all they're all responding very well to this um, this this CRISPR therapeutic. So you can see how quickly this um, field is growing from using it as a research tool to understand genes and how they function in cells and in embryos to actually uh, being used in the clinic to, uh, to discover diseases. Uh, so CRISPR is the preferred uh, version of these programmable nucleases. And this was a work that was also recognized this year by the Nobel Committee and a Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given to Jennifer Doudna and Manuel Charpentier this year, but that's, which is also uh, very exciting news. Okay, so going back to the very first gene editing experiment, this was done in 1985. So if you go back to our timeline, this was um, right about here, um, where Oliver Smithies, who studied globin genes in, in uh, human cells, was very interested in the idea that we might be able to use the process of homologous recombination between a uh, DNA that we make and introduce into cells. So can, so can we modify the genome of a human cell by using exogenous DNA that has homology to the region that we wanna change? And this was the first successful experiment that was uh, reported. Um, and what he did was he took a, piece of DNA from the beta globin locus, cut it 
and looked for homologous recombination events that occurred within the beta globin locus, and he was able to find them for the first time in a mammalian cell. And it was uh, so it was successfully introduced by homologous recombination. And so uh, what he concluded is um, that although many other problems remain to be solved, their results, our results, suggest that specific plan modifications of the globin locus and bone marrow stem cells may eventually be possible for the treatment of patients with uh, hemoglobinopathies, such as thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. So it's kind of interesting that the first uh, ever editing experiment was done by a, a researcher who had in mind this idea that if we could actually edit the genome of human cells, we might be able to cure diseases like sickle cell anemia. And as I just mentioned, uh, we have now data, for the first preliminary data that this actually does work and you can cure sickle cell, cell anemia with these programmable nucleases. And I'm gonna describe how, we, how, how we've gotten to this point. So now let's just step back and discuss a little bit about conventional gene targeting. This was the, the gene uh, targeting that I was performing as a graduate student. Uh, and it made use of these uh, very special cells called mouse embryonic stem cells. So these mouse ES cells or embryonic stem cells come from the early embryo from the blastocyst stage. And we can take the blastocyst from the uh, uh, pregnant moms, flush them out, and then we can culture the inner cell mass of these cells and we can propagate these cells. Now, what's really interesting about these cells is that they're normal diploid cells, but they um, will uh, divide forever. They, they're basically immortal cells at this stage. So if you provide the right growth factors, you can grow these in a dish forever. The other property they have is that if you take away certain factors and add others, you can differentiate these embryonic stem cells into virtually any other cell type of the mouse embryo. And so, so this is what is a classic example of a pluripotent stem cell. So it's a cell that has the ability to make virtually any cell in the body. So these were very interesting uh, cells to be working with. And I can remember um, trying an experiment where I took the cells and differentiated them into cardiomyocytes and uh, came in one day, looked down the microscope, and I saw these uh, beating heart muscles in the, in the tissue culture dish. Um, so the other property of these cells is that you can grow them, um, you can transfect them with DNA, you can isolate colonies, and then you can screen those colonies for um, homologous recombination events. Now, we knew at the time that these events were pretty rare, so we had to screen lots of colonies to identify those that underwent homologous recombination. Um, over the years, this um, uh, this method got a, a little bit better because we used very large homology arms. We used the positive drug selection and a negative drug selection, and that helped it increase the frequency of these homologous, rare homologous recombination events. And so it made it reasonably easy to build a vector and modify or knock out a gene by um, homologous recombination in this way. Now, once we have this population of embryonic stem cells that has been modified in, in the way that we intended, we go to the second step, which is to take these stem cells and put them back into the embryo. And these embryos will then go back into the inner cell mass and they will contribute to the development of the mice. And these mice are called chimeric because they're mosaic. They contain both the modified cells and the normal wild type cells. So you get these um, uh, what we call chimeras, which you can identify by coat color markers. And then you breed these chimeras to normal mice and you will find that these litters will contain some mice that have, that have your, your desired alteration, um, which we call a knockout mouse, for example, it's a gene targeted mice. So this work, um, the uh, identification of, of these embryonic stem cells and the ability to modify them by homologous recombination was awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, and this went to Oliver Smithies, the, the person who did the first experiment to knock out a gene. Uh, Mario Capecchi, who worked on the positive negative um, homologous recombination technique. And Martin Evans, who described the first uh, isolation and characterization of these 
special embryonic stem cells. So this was a very um, important time, I think. And a lot of the engineering and editing that we do now is really based on years and years of experience in perfecting uh, this whole um, gene targeting uh, technology in mouse embryonic stem cells. So we depend a lot on that experience. And for my own part, um, I, I took the, these methods uh, <clears throat> that I just described and um, led a team at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge, England, where we um, uh, knocked out basically every protein coding gene in the mouse. And I will point out that these knockouts in the stem cell are heterozygous. And only through breeding can we make them homozygous and determine the phenotype of the of the um, of the mutation. And so we generated this resource of knockouts in over 15,000 protein coding genes. These uh, cell lines have been used to drive mice, and now over half of these uh, have been phenotyped, and that work is ongoing. So we're going to to, to know in maybe five or ten more years what every single gene in the mouse. Is, is doing, presumably. The other point that I'd like to make is that we are able to make very sophisticated alleles um, this way. So we can um, essentially introduce uh, reporter genes. We can uh, make these uh, conditional by using the Crelox technology and so on. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but just to say that we can actually really make very specific and quite large modifications in genes using this conventional uh, this conventional approach. Okay, so now I want to turn to uh, programmable nucleases. And so there were, there's three of them uh, that are noteworthy. Uh, the first was the zinc finger nuclease uh, and that was developed in 1996. And this is an engineered protein. So we can engineer proteins to bind specific DNA sequences. And so if you know the structure of the uh, zinc finger itself, you can make amino acid changes to it to alter what bases that zinc finger is going to con come in contact with on DNA. So we have a DNA binding um, uh, zinc finger portion of the protein, and then that's fused to a, a nuclease, which is from bacteria, which is a FOC1 nuclease, so that we can actually use it to cut DNA on both strands. So these um, were, were uh, you know, quite successful and they, they were shown to really improve the efficiency of um, editing uh, because by introducing a cut in the DNA, you stimulate the cell uh, DNA repair mechanisms to uh, integrate DNA by homologous recombination. So this was this increased the efficiency of, of gene editing by homologous recombination by two orders of magnitude. So that's huge. So that makes it quite efficient. Um, using these nucleases. The problem with these nucleases is that they are hard to design, they're expensive to make. Uh, so it, they, didn't, they never really took off with the community. I mean, I was aware of these, but the amount of money and time to make these for a specific DNA sequence was uh, more than, than, than I could afford. So I never really uh, used zinc finger nucleases. And then tailing nucleases came out in 2010, and these were a little bit easier to design, uh, a little bit more um, um, uh, friendly for a research lab to use. But they're still, again, uh, these are engineered proteins that are, are modular and that each of these mod modules will um, identify or bind to a specific base in the DNA sequence. So that looked quite interesting. So I started to, uh, to uh, make a few of these uh, tail and nucleases uh, back in 2011. This is a year after they were described. And I was, uh, we were making, you know, re relatively uh, significant progress, but there was still issues with um, the fact that you had to make very large constructs and that you had to introduce those very large constructs into cells. So it w wasn't as um, easy as I, as I imagined it would be. So that was 2010. And then in 2012, the Cas9 nucleases came out and were described, which uh, really have transformed everything because these are very easy to use, very easy to, uh, to, to make these, um, these uh, nucleases to specific DNA sequences. 
Now, these are different from the zinc finger and the tail nucleases. These are RNA guided nucleases. So this is the so-called Cas9 nuclease system, which has this protein component, which has the um, ability to uh, cleave DNA. Uh, it also has an RNA. Uh, so this protein also recognizes this, uh, um, an RNA, which we call a guide RNA. And that, that guide RNA is then um, used by the system to identify a specific sequence in the genome by very simple uh, Watson and Crick base pairing. And all you need to know to get this um, system to bind a specific sequence is just um, the 20 is just to add 20 base pairs of, of this of your target sequence to this RNA, and you can direct that protein and get it to cut at uh, any site in the genome, essentially any site in the genome that you want. Now, um, this when this paper came out, it was really um, everybody kind of jumped in on this, and this was this was fantastic, and this was because uh, of the work of of Duda and Charpentier, who figured out how this system works. They figured out that the the way the system works is to bind an RNA. Um, and to which guides it to a specific sequence and then to cleave that DNA. Uh, so for that work, uh, they were um, uh, uh, awarded the Nobel Prize this year in chemistry. And I think this was a great, great day for women in science because these two uh, women really deserve this prize because it's completely transformed the way we do things now uh, in terms of gene editing. So I'm going to give you a, a little video here because I think that visually it's really uh, e easiest to understand how the system works with this uh, animated video. So I'm just going to run this for a couple of minutes. The CRISPR-Cas9 system is a tool for cutting DNA at a specifically targeted location. The technique has already revolutionized gene editing but scientists are always looking for new possibilities. So what else can CRISPR do? Since being discovered in a bacterial immune system, CRISPR-Cas9 has been adapted into a powerful tool for genomic research. There are two components to the system, a DNA cutting protein called Cas9, and an RNA molecule known as the guide RNA. Bound together, they form a complex that can identify and cut specific sections of DNA. First, Cas9 has to locate and bind to a common sequence in the genome called a PAM. Once the PAM is bound, the guide RNA unwinds part of the double helix. The RNA strand is designed to match and bind a particular sequence in the DNA. Once it's found the correct sequence, Cas9 can cut the DNA. Its two nuclease domains each make a nick, leading to a double-strand break. Although the cell will try to repair this break, the fixing process is error-prone and often inadvertently introduces mutations that disable the gene. This makes CRISPR a great tool for knocking out specific genes. OK, I'm going to stop it there. Um, so I hope you uh, enjoyed that little uh, animation. It's very, very nice. Um, uh, but the point of all of these programmable nucleases in, in, in terms of gene editing is, the, is that they make a double-stranded break. So you can take any of those nucleases described, CRISPR being the easiest one to use, uh, direct it to a specific sequence in the genome and have it cut both strands. Now, once you do that, the cell will die unless it can repair those strands. So double-stranded break repair is a very complex and redundant system in cells. It's devised many ways to repair double-stranded breaks because they are so toxic to the cell. So normally double-stranded breaks occur in our, our DNA um, from exposure to uh, ionizing radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, um, think Chernobyl. These, these are things that will break um, your DNA into two, and sometimes the, the, the DNA breaks also just uh, by itself in the cell. So we need ways to repair that. Otherwise, the cell is going to um, is going to die uh, because it won't be able to uh, 
bring that chromosome back together. So there are essentially two mechanisms to do that. One is called non-homologous end joining. Uh, that's what that was described at the end of that video. So what happens there is that these two ends are brought together uh, by uh, a set of enzymes, which recognize free ends of DNA, put them back together. Uh, most of the time that works uh, perfectly well. It, they, it's put together without any, any change in the DNA. But sometimes you do get uh, um, errors. So you get deletions and you get insertions. And a lot of it depends on the context of the DNA at that break, if there are microhomologies and so on. So it turns out that's one application of this, of this technology is that you can just induce a break and let the cell try to repair it. And uh, um, occasionally it's going to introduce a mutation. And these mutations, which are small deletions in, in, in indels, as you can see, would uh, be enough to dis dis disrupt gene function. So if we say took an exon of a DNA uh, of a gene, uh, directed a, one of these nucleases to that exon, broke it in the middle, and then we had insertions and deletions of, of, of bases, you can see how, that's gonna, how that is gonna inactivate that protein. So often it causes a shift in the reading frame. And so you end up with a nonsense mutation occurring. So this is a very uh, convenient and, and, and relatively efficient way to generate knockouts. And so this is one of the main, major applications of CRISPR up to now has been to use this to make small uh, perturbations in genes or in other sequences of interest to see what happens. So it's, it's a real it's a real important research tool, but it's not precise. You don't you can't really predict the outcome of of, of these experiments, and so you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, so the other thing that we know is that the double stranded break is also going to use any uh, donor template that has homology to that region that around the breakpoint, and it will use that donor template to repair that double-stranded break. And this occurs at a relatively uh, high efficiency as well. So if we uh, induce the double-stranded break and include a donor template, um, we can actually make very precise modifications. So we can change single bases. We can introduce uh, segments, uh, large segments of DNA. We can make precise deletions. So really, I, I would say that the, um, the best way to use this uh, um, system is in a precise way, especially if you want to correct uh, hu human diseases, uh, you want to be very precise in, in what, you, what you do, and you may not necessarily want to uh, create uh, other mutations that might uh, not give you the, the outcome you expect. So the point here is that we can make uh, simple knockouts, but we can also use uh, this system to make precise modifications in the presence of donor templates. Now these donor templates can be double-stranded DNA, they can be single-stranded DNA, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, so how do we use these nucleases? So um, I'll give you two examples. So, so we often use them in cultured cells, and as I said, we use human, we, we study human induced pluripotent stem cells and look at what genes are doing. And then we also model human diseases in these cells. So what you need is a way to introduce these um, nucleases into the cell for them to be active and then to uh, effect the change that you want. So there are a number of ways to introduce these um, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, and, the, and the DNA repair template if that's what you want to do, um, using either electroporation or using lipid vesicles, and even viruses can be used. We prefer electroporation. It's simple. It's a very efficient way to deliver DNA and protein to the cell. Basically, electroporation punches holes in the cell and, and drives um, <clears throat> these um, charged molecules of DNA or protein into the cell. So it's a very efficient um, system to use to deliver uh, the Cas9 and the guide and, and also the repair template, if that's what you're doing. Uh, initially, people were starting started to use uh, expression plasmids, but now people are moving more towards using actually recombinant Cas9 protein or an mRNA that encodes uh, Cas9 protein and guide RNAs, which are actually small, so you can make them as synthetic RNAs. So that's uh, one way you can introduce the um, 
these reagents into cells. Now, if you're working with embryos, for example, mouse embryos, uh, you can actually just physically inject these um, reagents into the fertilized egg. So this is the one cell embryo. And you can, you can inject it directly into the nucleus of that, uh, deliver it directly in there, or you can put it into the cytoplasm of the, of the, of the embryo. And so that's done by microinjection, but they've also found that electroporation works very well as well to introduce these reagents into the one cell embryo. So this is now taking off where one cell embryos are modified simply by electroporating these um, embryos with these reagents. And the other point is that the, um, certain companies have made a, um, a business out of providing these reagents for us. Uh, so you can, re, you can, for any experiment you wanna do in cells for now, for example, you can, reorder, you can order all the reagents that you need online by IDT. So you can order the, the, the nuclease that you want, you can design the guide and order, order that through this um, interface and you can order the donor template if it's an oligo, for example. So these companies have really stepped up and taken, taken um, this technology and made it available to everyone in a format that everybody can use. So that's another really important aspect of this is that we have companies that are supporting this work. Okay, so I wanna uh, just uh, go through a, just a little um, tutorial on how we design, design guide RNAs for such experiments. And so I just, uh, I wanna use this example of the sickle cell anemia mutation. So this is a mutation in exon one of the human beta globin gene. And it's a mutation, it's, it's, a, it's a T, uh, a GT, uh, <clears throat> it's a GTG is the mutation which encodes a valine. And this is what causes sickle cell anemia. So a lot of human diseases are just a single base change uh, in, in, in a gene. Uh, so to correct that, we want to uh, change the GTG codon that encodes for valine to a GAG codon, which encodes for glutamic acid. And that should restore the function of hemoglobin and then that would cure sickle cell anemia. So this is a very simple editing experiment now with CRISPR. Um, so you, before I get into this um, little exercise, let's just review again the, the chemical structure of DNA. <coughs> just to remind you, DNA is a double stranded DNA is is a, is a DNA helix. DNA is a DNA helix. And there are two strands anti-parallel to each other. So one will have a, a five prime end going in this direction. And the other one will have a five prime end going in this direction. So they're anti-parallel. <coughs> it's a convention we call the five prime end, the five prime end because this is the five position carbon here and then the three prime end, because this is the three position carbon here. So we five prime to three prime is how we talk about uh, DNA. Uh, of course, we have the, the four bases, um, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. And what holds these two strands together is the, there's a hydrogen bonding between complementary bases. So A and T are complementary to other G and C and vice versa. <coughs> C is complementary to G. So that's what holds the helix together. Um, so when we look at a DNA sequence, uh, by convention, the top strand is always five prime to three prime. Sometimes we don't even show the bottom strand, but I'm showing the bottom strand here. So any piece of DNA is gonna have five prime, three prime in this direction. And then a set of complementary bases, five prime, three prime in the other direction. So we call that the top strand, we call that the bottom strand. So for this little exercise, we need to find a guide RNA that overlaps this mutation because what we want to be able to do is cut it near the mutation and then supply a repair template that will change that T base uh, to an A base on the top strand. Okay, so now in that video, uh, what we need in order for, <coughs> excuse me, 
in order for Cas9 to recognize DNA, there has to be a PAM site right next to it. So the PAM site is NGG. So that's encoded in the, the genome. It's not part of the guide. It has to be there. It's obligatory. So in order to design a guide, we need to find an NGG in the sequence. Now this is five prime NGG, three prime. So you can see here, there's an NGG, AGG, but that doesn't overlap. So that's not going to work. It's going to, it's going to cut the DNA, but then the mutation we want to change is outside of that. Uh, the problem with cutting outside of that is that uh, the, the repair template will um, introduce the change, but it will get cut again. So we can't do that. So we need an overlapping guide. So are there any other overlapping guides that anyone can see? Um, that Now, it can be on one strand or it could be on the other. So we have to look at both strands. So NGG, there's one. Uh, there's another one, but that doesn't overlap. How about on the other strand? So we go in this direction, five prime to three prime. So we see, ah, oh, there's a GG. There's an NGG, but then that's not overlapping the mutation. Ah, there's an NGG, but that's NGG. We can't use that one either because N can be any base. So again, you'd, you'd make the change, but then it would get cut again because it, it still has the, the, the PAM site and the guide sequence. So that's not going to work. Um, sorry, I said that's a CC. So here it is, this GGA, this is the PAM site. So by scanning the sequence, you can do, have computer programs do this for you, but um, you can also just scan the sequence, look for the NGG, this is the PAM right here, um, NGG. And this highlighted sequence is the guide that you order. Um, now the guide is an RNA, so we need the five prime to three prime, 20 base pair sequence, five prime to three prime, but wherever there's a T in DNA, we know we have to substitute it for a U in RNA. So the actual guide we, that we would order from the company would be this guide here, G-U-A-A-C-G-G. And you can see that's G-U-A-A-C-G-G. So that's the guide RNA. <clears throat> now the template is, is, is easy. All you need to do is take this top strand and change that T, as we as we said, the mutant mutation T into an A. So we just put it an A into the top strand. We order that, and now we have the reagents that we need to make this change to correct this mutation. It's as simple as that. Okay, so um, I want to be mindful of the time. Yeah, we're getting we're, we're getting. Um, <clears throat> getting on with time. So I was going to tell you uh, about our work um, where we are applying gene editing technology to develop disease models in human pluripotent stem cells. Um, but I'm going to have to skip that for the purposes of this, of the time as we're running out. Um, but I'll just summarize it by saying that we can use these uh, cells, induce pluripotent stem cells. Um, as, as the cells for gene editing. Uh, and this system is so efficient. And because the enzymes will cut on both chromosomes, we can actually modify both copies simultaneously. And that's hugely important. So if you think about um, what I talked about earlier with the mouse, we were only able to modify one copy of the gene in mouse hemorrhagic stem cells. We had to make a mouse and use breeding to make it homozygous. So we had both copies knocked out. But this technology, CRISPR, allows us to modify both copies of the chromosome, chromosome simultaneously. So we can start to look at function of DNA sequences, um, uh, uh, or we can develop uh, disease models that require modification of both copies of the gene. So that's hugely important. And so what CRISPR technology has done for us is it's opened up this whole area where we can finally do genetics in a normal diploid cell, which is this iPS cell. And the advantage of the iPS cell is that we can differentiate these into virtually any cell type of the body. So we can use this as to model diseases, to understand cell biology and to understand early development. So it's a fantastic system to work with. And so we've been working with that for several years now. We've improved the system. We've gotten Cas9 
uh, which originally was rather inefficient at making uh, <clears throat> changes by homology directed repair, only about 10% of the alleles in unselected cells. We've uh, improved that using uh, reporter systems to test different conditions. And we've got um, now HDR rates up over uh, 68%. So in fact, now we're seeing uh, HDR efficiencies uh, sometimes over 90%. <laughs> And so we've been using this technology to introduce patient mutations into these iPS cells uh, to model neurodegenerative disease and then to use those cells uh, to differentiate them to neurons and then to uh, assess the phenotypes in those cells. And all I can say is that the efficiency of doing this is phenomenally high. And you can see here that we can get, in some cases, uh, <clears throat> over 90% of the clones have biallelic modification of the gene to introduce this genetic mutation. Uh, it's so high, in fact, we've had to uh, take uh, measures to control the efficiency of HDR using a trick using dead Cas9. I don't have time to talk about that, but just to say that we can use dead Cas9, which will, will not cleave, it'll bind DNA, but not cleave it, to compete uh, against active Cas9 so that we can actually control the outcome of these experiments. So initially all we got were homozygous, but by adding Cas dead Cas9 in, we can increase the number of wild type, so uh, heterozygous and wild type clones that we get from these experiments. So it's fantastically efficient and we have very good methods for fluent engineering of uh, mutants, disease alleles, and then we can also just do the reverse and revert and, and revert them back to wild type. Um, so this revertant um, cell is really important control because we uh, often worry that there can be problems that occur during the editing process of, of cells and just during culture of cells. So we wanna be really sure that the phenotype we observe in a mutant cell goes away when we revert that mutation back to wild type. So that's the gold standard control that we wanna use for these experiments. Okay, so now I want to test your knowledge again before moving on to some of the um, medical um, applications of the technology. So let's start by asking you how many chromosomes are in each of your cells? Okay, not Quite a consensus, but it's starting to get there. D, 46 is correct. So we have 22 pairs of autosomes, that makes 44. And then we have the X and the Y, so that makes 46. Now the sperm and egg contain how many chromosomes? That's right, it's half that. that, that, that we, that through the process of meiosis, we uh, separate those pairs of chromosomes. So we have only 23 in a sperm and an egg, and when they come together, we restore 46. Very good. So dominant inherited traits are caused by a variant in one copy of a chromosome, both copies of a chromosome, all of the above. Yeah, we're seeing A's and C's. This is a little tricky question. It's actually not very well uh, worded. Um, dominant traits occur um, <clears throat> if one copy of the chromosome is mutated. You see the effects, but uh, many dominant diseases, you can actually inherit that on both copies and um, <clears throat> uh, uh, you, you see the same effect, but that's, that's, that's a little tricky. So we'll, we'll go with A as the correct answer here. That the dominant inherited trait are usually caused by a variant on one copy of the chromosome. What about recessive inherited diseases? Great, got the consensus around both copies. That's right, both copies. Now, finally, if both parents are carriers of a recessive mutation, what fraction of the children will have the disease? All right, great. That's mostly A's, which is correct, one quarter. So to figure that out, um, sorry, 
you have to uh, use your Punnett squares, and you can see, for example, in cystic fibrosis, this is a recessive trait. Little f. These are the um, alleles in the sperm and in the egg, and when you bring them together, you see that only one quarter are affected. Seven, seventy-five percent are non-affected, but these f little f's, because it's recessive, are termed carriers. They don't they don't show the phenotype but they can pass on that trait to future generations. So that's right. And this is an example of hunting the disease where mutation in one copy of the chromosome is causing this disease. And so 50% uh, will be affected if you have um, a carrier and, a, and a, a normal individual. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, finish up here by talking about some clinical applications of genome editing technology. On one end of the spectrum, we have the use of CRISPR to cure disease. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the possibility that we can actually improve human species um, by applying the technology to human uh, embryos. OK, let's start with curing uh, HIV. And this was first done actually not with CRISPR, but with the zinc finger nuclease. Uh, and it turns out that um, we can learn a lot from uh, people who are out there in, the, in our population, because in one study, it was found that individuals with a mutation in CCR5, which is a cell surface protein, which makes up the receptor for HIV, are resistant to HIV infection, yet these individuals are normal. So they can do without the CCR5 protein, and they, can, they, they still um, are have normal, healthy individuals. So that gave... Um, the company Sangabo, the idea that they could actually cure HIV potentially. People were infected with HIV by taking their blood cells out, removing CCR5, so that they would not be uh, able to be infected by uh, ongoing HIV infection. And eventually those cells would take over and that person would be cured of HIV. Very, very clever. Uh, and using information from the natural human population which is even better because we know that the experiment has been done. The humans without this gene are okay. Uh, so the clinical trial involved taking a, a blood donation from the uh, individual, taking their cells, enriching for CD4 positive cells, which are your T cells. And then they use a virus, an adenovirus, to infect these cells to deliver the zinc finger that will knock out CCR5. That's basically what they did here. They can activate these cells, expand them, and then put them back in the patient. Uh, and these cells will then circulate for a while. And th those cells will not um, become infected with HIV. And eventually, you expect to see more and more of their cells are um, lacking CCR5. Uh, and this trial, which began in 2010, I think an, ended uh, uh, five, five or six years ago, uh, uh, looked very promising. So they saw the titers of HIV drop, and they saw the number of um, <clears throat> CCR5 mutant cells in, in the blood uh, was, was significant. So it seemed to uh, allow these infected individuals to stop using these protease inhibitors and still maintain a low HIV titer in their systems. So uh, that, that trial worked quite nicely. Um, now let's move to uh, curing sickle cell anemia. This is the more recent example. And this is just to remind you, sickle cell anemia is a recessive trait. So uh, if two carriers have children, um, you're going to have one who's affected that has uh, inherited both copies of the sickle cell gene, uh, and uh, the three quarters are unaffected, but two of the uh, half of the children will be carriers, so they'll pass it on to the next generation. And as I said, uh, sickle cell anemia is uh, an example, like many uh, human disease genes, of just a single base change, changing a glutamic acid to a valine, and that's enough to create this phenotype in blood cells under low oxygen tension where they tend to sickle. People have crises. They have uh, <clears throat> um, problems with their circulation because these, these um, tend to clot and, and create problems, um, uh, occlusions in, in, in their veins and capillaries, which can be very painful. And so they suffer these uh, bouts of very painful um, side effects of the sickle 
uh, uh, sickling of the blood. Now, the cure for sickle cell anemia is, is not what you might have thought. And so they didn't go and change that base in the sickle cell gene. They found a different way of doing it, which again comes from the human population because there are individuals in our population with mutations in a gene called BCL11A, which seem to be resistant to the effects of sickle cell anemia. So they will have both copies of the sickle cell gene, but they won't have any um, problems like other sickle cell patients. And when they sequenced those individuals, they found actually they had a single nucleotide polymorphism in BCL11A, um, which was a single base change. So it's uh, normally we're GG at that position. These individuals had AA, so they had a G to A change on both copies of the chromosomes. And this protected them from the ravaging effects of sickle cell anemia. So how does that work? So a lot of interesting work went into figuring that out. So it turns out BCL11A is a transcriptional repressor. Um, and it represses uh, after birth, the expression of the fetal beta globin gene. So if you look at uh, expression during development, <clears throat> so initially uh, you have embryonic uh, uh, beta globin and that's replaced by fetal beta globin in the fetal liver stage. And then uh, uh, after birth, you see the fetal beta globin levels drop and beta globin, adult, adult beta globin uh, increases. So it's the adult beta globin in sickle cell anemia that causes the problems. But the fetal uh, beta globin would suffice just fine, but it gets turned off. But, but in these individuals with the BCLA mutation, this repressor uh, is no longer there. And so you get uh, fetal, beta, uh, fetal beta globin uh, expression throughout adult life. And it's the expression of that fetal beta globin that protects you from this uh, disease, uh, symptoms of this disease. So you're replacing the, the, the beta globin with the sickle cell mutation with fetal beta, beta globin. Um, <clears throat> so that's a very clever strategy because all you need to know is um, you just have to knock out using CRISPR this, um, this site in BCL11A so that it is not uh, able to repress fetal, fetal expression of fetal beta globin. And that should protect you from uh, the, the symptoms of, of, of um, sickle cell anemia, as well as other um, uh, thalassemias. So that's exactly what they did. They, they started a sickle cell uh, trial. This is the first CRISPR trial. Um, it's, it's been given the number CTX1. So it's a, essentially it's a Cas9 RNP that's uh, directed to this BCLA enhancer element. <clears throat> so in this case, they take sickle cell patients they take from their bone marrow CD34 plus positive cells, which are your uh, precursors of hematopoietic stem cells, precursors. You can uh, then introduce this uh, CRISPR into those cells to knock out BCL11A enhancer and then put them back in to the body, which they go back to the bone marrow and they, they, they're resident there and they will continue to um, um, produce uh, blood cells for, for many, many years afterwards. <coughs> so the preliminary um, results of this experiment was reported in June of this year. And look very promising. So in one individual, they found um, expression of fetal, fetal, fetal hemoglobin, 41.46.1% one percent and blood cells producing fetal hemoglobin went up to 99.7 percent so by reconstituting their blood cell system with this mutation mutant cell they're able to now express uh, fetal hemoglobin and essentially this prevents these uh, vasoocclusive crises or VOCs and this has now gone on for over nine months so this is ex extremely promising. And there's a similar trial in, in progress now with using the same reagent CTX-01 to treat beta thalassemias. So that's hugely exciting. Okay, so we need to wrap it up, right? So here are the clinical applications for CRISPR technology. 
Um, what I just described is called ex vivo. So we modify somatic cells in culture and then transplant them back into the patient. So that's probably the easiest um, way to use CRISPR technology. And it represents a conventional treatment. People are now starting to think about, well, can we actually deliver CRISPR to the tissues, say the brain or the pancreas directly? And so we don't have to take out cells and put them back. So this is uh, in vivo um, therapies would involve the modification of somatic cells directly in the patient. And again, that's conventional treatment. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's been a number of doctors who have suggested that um, well, we could get rid of these inherited diseases entirely from the human embryo itself. Uh, so it's not born with inherited disease. So this is called germline modification. So we would modify the germ cells or embryos. Uh, but the problem with this is that we will, any, anything we introduce into those cells, any genetic modifications that may have occurred outside of the one you intended would be passed on to future generations. So, and this really is a departure from normal medicine. This is a treatment of an unborn child. So this is hugely controversial. Um, and I will stop by asking what your thoughts are on this, but I'm not able to advance my slide. Okay, so we're out of time. So I'm gonna stop there and um, take any questions. Have we lost everyone? Okay, so we got a few questions. Um, <clears throat> so how uh, can one as a young student be involved in such research? Um, I would say that these, these reagents, as you say, are expensive. And I doubt that many schools would have resources to actually um, pay for and use these uh, these these types do these kinds of experiments um, that requires I think a lot more than what you would normally do in a high school lab at least that's been my experience so I'm not sure you'd be able to actually do the experiments yourselves but what I would encourage you to do is learn as much as you can about CRISPR technology because I think it's becoming uh, so um, widespread in its use for so many different applications that it's very likely that if you get to um, to college and you start to um, volunteer in, in, in people's labs, there's going to be somebody working with this system uh, for sure. It's, it's becoming ubiquitous, actually, this technology for so many different applications. So I would encourage you to continue to um, look out for papers on CRISPR technology. I've only touched the tip of the iceberg here, um, talking about gene editing. There are many other applications that, um, that, that involve other uses of this programmable um, nuclease, well, this programmable protein. Um, it can home into any sequence and modify it in many different ways. So I would keep, um, uh, studying what you know the advances in CRISPR technology over the next few years because it's really moving quickly and I think by the time you get to graduate school if you know about this uh, you know uh, quite a bit about these technologies it's going to be immensely helpful in your studies if you if you want to be a medical doctor then I think you should also be paying attention to this because these things are now in the clinic and so understanding how they work drawbacks pitfalls um, possible, problems that can occur uh, during the editing processes, all this sort of thing you should be, uh, I think, uh, interested in and knowledgeable of if you're entering uh, medical school. Uh, the other way you can do this, I think, is to do MD-PhDs. So you can do um, uh, 
work in terms of pushing the technology forward as a PhD student and then using your your uh, knowledge as a doctor begin to apply this technology. So I think um, I, that's one of, my, one of my regrets is that I didn't go to medical school. So I went to a, straight into a PhD and it was only when I started learning more about mouse uh, physiology, I started thinking, hmm, this is interesting, what happens in humans? And so I think that information about what happens in humans, what's, you know, what's um, that some medical, uh, degree would have been uh, quite useful for me. <clears throat> now, um, has there been much research in the viability of iPSCs in modeling COVID's long-term effects like cardiomyocytes? Um, <clears throat> so COVID research is just starting. I mean, um, people are getting organized now. Uh, I know at Jackson Labs, there are people who are very interested in using iPSCs uh, to, to help understand COVID infection and to model uh, COVID, COVID infection. And so I think that's an, an excellent suggestion and it would be a great platform to start thinking about um, the effect of COVID on other uh, tissue types other than the lung epithelial cells. We know that it can affect neurons. We know it can affect um, kidney cells and so on. So and we would have access actually to those cell types uh, from iPS cells. So I think that's an excellent suggestion. And my, my guess is that people are gonna be starting to work in this direction. Uh, do you recommend any online sources? You know, what I do is when I, when I want to look something up, I would just Google it and, uh, or go to YouTube. There's just amazing amounts of information now online about CRISPR, you saw that one animated uh, movie, there's tons more. Um, I would start uh, looking at those. That's a good way to start uh, these um, sort of popular science uh, um, videos or uh, popular science articles, they say in New Scientist. These are a good way to introduce you to the subject, but eventually I think it's worthwhile thinking about reading the primary literature uh, so, so that you stay on top of things. Um, and that takes a little bit more effort because you have to learn a lot of jargon. Um, you, I probably gave you a lot of jargon in my talk. Uh, maybe you didn't catch half of the things I was saying because a lot of it is jargon. You have to, you have to learn it, what, what that means. So I would start with kind of uh, popular science um, articles and videos, but eventually move towards actually reading the primary paper so you understand in detail how these things work and they'll discuss what things can go wrong. And so you have a much deeper understanding of what you're, what you're doing by reading the primary papers. Okay. Um, so what careers can be pursued in gene editing? Um, asks Gleb and um, there are, I think lots of uh, careers in um, gene editing. Well. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't confine myself just to gene editing. I would say to maybe gene modification or CRISPR technology. So, um, as I said, this technology is becoming ubiquitous in biomedical research. Everybody's using it now for one thing or the other. Um, so, I think if you uh, understand this technology and you learn how to use it, that you can work in many different labs and many different contexts, and even in in, in the medical clinics. Uh, applying this um, information. So there's going to be research jobs in labs, there's going to be biotechnology companies are hiring people like crazy who know this, who, who know about CRISPR technology because they're, they're the ones, the biotechnology companies are the ones who are going to develop these, these medicines, these CRISPR-based medicines. And then there are people that work in the clinic who actually run these clinical trials and work with patients. Um, so I think, you know, from research to, 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 to therapeutic application and everything in between, uh, the, um, I think the careers for those who understand this technology um, are booming at this point. Uh, so I'd, I'd keep, an eye, keep, keep an eye out for that. So if you can go to your um, interview uh, for your job with some, even if it's a, a you know, volunteering, for the summer to work at someone's lab. If you can go there with a 
a knowledge of CRISPR and say, that, do you want to you know, apply it? And this is how you think you could apply it to the problem they're studying. I think you would really impress them. And that, that helps you get the foot in the door. So, I, so we hire people um, these days and um, <clears throat> they know we work with CRISPR and they, they research it and they come to the interview and they can talk to us about how it works and how excited they are to use it and so on. And that's deep, that's very impressive. So I think I would um, encourage you to learn as much as you can before your job interview. Okay. Do you mind sharing a references direction for someone to write up literature review? Oh, you know, this is this is this is crazy. You put you put CRISPR into PubMed and you just get so many um, articles back, thousands of them, and you don't know which ones you know um, you should focus on reading. So, um, what I would recommend to you to do is to take a a nice recent review from a high impact journal like Nature and Nature Methods, uh, methods and so on, because in those reviews they will also um, point you to the um, most important, I guess, uh, papers that have been published in this in this area. So I think a good way to approach a literature review is to start with a uh, someone else's review, someone who knows, uh, and there's quite a few now, uh, published in Nature, Science, uh, Nature, um, Cell, and so on, um, that describe CRISPR uh, and specifically CRISPR and gene therapy. Start with a review and then look up all of the papers that look like they, these are the seminal papers that made you know, these, these, um, these advances possible. That's my recommendation. Um, I have to do this every time I write a paper. I haven't written a paper for a year now. I'm about to start writing another paper. I have to go and, and uh, look up all the papers that have come out in that past year. And this is how I generally uh, try to hunt them down because if you just search for CRISPR, you're gonna get so many papers. You don't know which ones are the most important. Um, <clears throat> so start with, a, with a, an, an expert review. All right, I think we better wrap it up. I think people are off. There are plenty, many, many questions. I don't know, can I do some of this offline, Samantha? Uh, yeah, so in terms of that, uh, I think it would be better if you could just uh, provide your contact information and if anyone else uh, still has any questions, they can uh, directly email you, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, feel free to email me with questions. I'm not sure how, how long this chat will be open and how many I can get to. Yeah, some good questions. Well, thanks for your attention. I hope you understood some of what I said today. Uh, and I hope you're interested and excited to uh, delve more into this area of CRISPR technology in your in the future and keep it in mind uh, when when and if you uh, decide to to uh, enter biomedical sciences. Thank you for your attention and have a great day or evening. <laughs>